Well, our text today is from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. So I'll read it for us now. It goes like this. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, um, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. This is God's word. In my family, we have a practice of making up words to capture concepts that the English language just seems to fall short of. And one of these words is unobtainium. And that word signifies something you really want, even need, that's quite specific, that you cannot get for the life of you. It could be um, a pair of shoes that perfectly matches the dress you just bought and the price point you want in the timeline you need it, but you just can't find it. It's unobtainium. Or it might be a vacation that you are really longing to go on with all your friends and everyone's available at the same time, but you just can't quite seem to make it work. It becomes unobtainium. And in COVID-19 times here, we have experienced so many things as unobtainium. Some things we never imagined would be unobtainium, like toilet paper or yeast or a good haircut, but also things that are a little bit more meaningful, like a meal sitting right next to friends with no masks on. Those things are unobtainium. Well, today's story revolves around the experience of something unobtainium, that experience of something we are keenly aware of needing and wanting and our inability to make it happen. And it causes us to look at how to live through that experience with faith. In this story, something that's deeply longed for, that's painfully needed, that's impossible to make happen, comes to pass. This woman, Hannah, who we just read about, has a son after a lifetime of infertility, a son that God gave her. And as we'll soon see, this son had the potential to take her out of a very precarious, uncertain place to one of certainty and security. But as we just read, rather than keeping the son, she gives him back to God. That's striking. What would possess a person to give up the thing that she has longed for for so long and finally gotten, the thing that could change her life forever? Well, let's join Hannah in the story of her life to see why she might do that and what it means for us in our own needs and longings. And to do that, we're going to actually refer back to the beginning of the chapter. Um, see, when we catch up with Hannah here at the temple where she's giving her son away, she's actually lived a whole life before that. That has led her to that point. See, at the beginning of the chapter, when we first meet her in the Bible, Hannah was a woman in a really tight spot. She was an infertile wife. And in our culture, that doesn't necessarily translate, right? We are familiar with the grief that often accompanies infertility, and Hannah is most likely experiencing that, right? That grief that, like, oh, my body just doesn't do what I expected it to, what I hoped it would. Um, I can't have the child from my own body that I would want, and the pain that's associated with that. But that pain 
is compounded because for Hannah, because being an infertile woman was particularly problematic in her culture, right? In Hannah's time and place, a woman's worth hinged on her ability to produce children and specifically sons, because sons were the ones who would inherit the father's wealth and ensure the economic security of the family. They guaranteed that the family would be all right. And they would also carry the father's name into the next generation, moving that name forward in history, which would bring honor to the family. And also in this system, a son would be the one who would end up caring for his mother once his father had passed away. So because Hannah is unable to produce a son, she, one, is unable to do the thing that her culture has said she's valued for, and thus experiencing a great deal of shame personally and publicly, not to mention that she can't bring honor to her family in the way that she probably would like to. And two, she's unable to provide a solid financial future for her family and thereby for herself. So both her present and her future are pretty hopeless. She's destined for a life of challenge and she's in that life already. Now, to make matters worse, Elkanah did what many men of means did. And the Bible's pretty clear that Elkanah really loves Hannah, but he needs to secure his wealth and make sure his name goes forward. So he marries a second wife. And the second wife is Peninnah. And you guessed it, Panina can have children, and she ends up having many of them, including sons. And Panina uses this to torment Hannah. She makes Hannah's life a living hell by pointing out at every opportunity she has that Hannah's, Hannah can't have kids, particularly that God has closed Hannah's womb. And she makes a particular point to do this when Hannah is going to the house of God, presumably to pray. It's like she's saying, Peninnah is saying, why are you even going there? There's no hope for you there. God's not, God's the one who's closed your womb. Why are you, why, what are you trying to get at there? And so when we sit with this, like living with that level of insult and torment, just year after year, the Bible says this went on for years and years, that cuts at a person and breaks them down. Hannah is already in a hopeless situation and Peninnah is crushing whatever hope she may have had. So Hannah understandably becomes so troubled and grieved that she's often weeping and not eating. She is in deep visceral pain. Her only way out of this miserable existence seems to be to have a son of her own, right? Only then could she shut up Peninnah and have the honor and security she so desperately needs for her to be okay, for her to have a life. But Hannah has no power to make that happen, right? She can't make herself fertile. It's just a no-go. So she is stuck. She's stuck in the awareness of her need, her longing for it to change, and powerlessness to see it fulfilled. There are just barriers everywhere and it sends her into this broken-hearted cycle of anguish and grief. Hannah's experience feels familiar to me. I mean, doesn't it for you? Don't we experience stuck places like Hannah did? These places where we are longing for our situation to change, looking for and hoping for the thing that will change it, and yet being so aware that we are powerless to make it happen. <clears throat> places like the place that longs for relief from chronic pain, that pain that you live with each day, and you might try things, but it just won't go away. The place that longs for marriage or family, but you just can't seem to find the right person and Good luck trying that in these times, right? Or like the place that longs for an end to the persistent injustice in our country's racist policies. And you might protest and organize, but nothing really seems to change or changes so slow. Or it could be a place that longs for forgiveness from someone, but you can't make them give it. 
could be a longing for a freedom from addiction, but you relapse and then feel powerless to get over that. Or it could be a place that just longs for money to pay the bills and keep a roof over your head, but your job gets pulled out from under you and you realize that it's not really in your control. These are just a couple, but there are so many stuck places that we meet in our life. So many places where we experience hopelessness, where we, like Hannah, can't realize we cannot make our longings come to life. We can't solve the problem on our own. Now, you, you may have heard that list and thought, but I've gotten some of those things. But isn't it true that even when you get the thing you need, there's always another thing right behind it? another problem that arises and puts you right back into another stuck place or has the potential to take you to another stuck place. We are in this endless position of hopelessness, potential hopelessness. So what do we do? Like, how do we get out of this cycle of stuckness? Well, let's look back at Hannah. Hannah makes a bold move in the midst of her stuckness in the midst of her hopelessness. She goes to the only one with the power to address her need, God himself. She shows, she goes to the only one who can do something about it. He closed her womb. He's the only one who can help her with it. And when she goes to him, she pours out her heart in prayer, sharing her grief and her anguish, her anxiety and distress, her utter frustration and deep despair with God. She meets with him in her stuck place. He is there with her in that place. Let's not lose sight of that. God is there with her. And as she is there with God, just pouring all of this out, this vow emerges from her lips. And she says, Lord Almighty. She is calling on God's powerful name. She's aware that she's interacting with a powerful God who was with her in her grief. And then she says, if you look at my misery, if you remember me, if you don't forget me, she's saying, see me, stop neglecting me, do something about my circumstance because no one else can and no one really seems to see me for who I really am. And then she says, but if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you for his whole life and not a razor will touch his head, which that razor part is a reference to a vow that would set apart a person for the Lord's service. So she's saying like, he's going to be fully yours. This vow should stop us in our freaking tracks. When I read this, I'm like, I'm sorry, what now? Hannah, you are going to give away the thing that you need. What is going on here? Right? In this vow, she, she's asking for what she needs, the thing that could change her whole situation and in the same breath promises to give it back to God. What is going on here? Well, in this vow, we see that Hannah's hope has shifted. In the course of her prayer, as she sits with her powerlessness in the presence of a powerful God, Hannah realizes that if God can give her a son, then it's not the son that she's dependent on for her life. It's God himself. She is no longer dependent on the sun for her livelihood or for her joy. She is dependent on God for all those things and much more. Hannah's hope is no longer in her need. It is in the giver. This is what breaks Hannah free. Hannah breaks free by putting her hope in, not in the need, but in the giver. Her hope is not in the need. It is in the giver. And when Hannah leaves this place of prayer, the Bible says she leaves her sadness behind. She leaves with joy. So fast forwarding, when we catch up with Hannah at the temple, she has the son that God has given her. God saw her distress and responded to her vow. He gave her the son that she asked for. He held up his end of the vow. This is a big deal. He is communicating with her um, by giving her this son. Hey, I'm in this with you. I was there when you were praying and in your misery, and I'm here with you now. God is in this with us, everyone, just like he was with Hannah. And having experienced that God is with her, 
Hannah is able to complete her vow and give her son to God. It's her hope that she had in that place of longing and stuckness and despair that empowers her. Her hope empowers her. She's faithfully acting from the hope that she has carried in her heart for years. A hope that doesn't rest her security or her life on her son, but a hope on God himself. A hope in the giver. Friends, today we are invited to put our hope not in what we need, but in the giver. Hannah's life challenges us to see that our hope in our life is found in God and God alone. Our hope is not in the money we need or the job we need to have that money. It is in the God who provides for us. Our hope is not in the marriage or the family that we want. It is in the God who loves us deeply and is intimate with us. Our hope is not in the recovery from addiction, but in the, the God who helps us recover and sets us free. Our hope is not in the forgiveness we long for from someone else. It's in our forgiving God. Our hope is not in the end to racial injustice in itself. It is in the God of justice who is bringing that justice about. Our God is not in the healing that we need. It is in the God who heals and so on and for so forth. And this is critical because if our hope is anywhere else, we will be crushed like Hannah was, like we experience. See, when our hope is in the giver, we can hope for the things we want without being crushed. I'm going to say that again. When our hope is in the giver, we can hope for the things we want without being crushed. When our hope is in the giver, we can even let go of the things that we feel or we want or need to be okay because we know that we have what we most need and want, God himself. He is in this with us. He has given us his son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us to show us that he is in this life with us and he is in it to give us a hope that cannot be shaken. So I want to ask you this morning, how is God inviting you to put your hope in him? For me, these days, it looks actually a lot like Hannah. It looks like getting on my knees and just pouring out my soul and weeping bitterly and letting it all out with God and experiencing him with me in my grief. That is what is sustaining me to move forward with hope in our world. So maybe he is drawing you now. He's inviting you now to heartfelt and vulnerable prayer where you just lay your burdens down with him and you get to experience him with you in them. Maybe he's asking you to stop trying so hard to figure it out or make that thing happen and to rest in him and trust him with it instead. Maybe he is inviting you to be with him in his own silent grief over the state of our situation, over the injustice in our nation. And maybe he's inviting you to take action that's based on a hope in his justice and in response to his grief and your own. Maybe he's inviting you to experience a joy that cannot be taken away. And maybe he's inviting you to put your hope in him for the first time and to respond to his invitation to trust him with your life. My friends, let's just come to him like Hannah did and let him give us the hope that we desperately need, a hope that sets us free.